Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fundera's webinar on SBA 7A loans. This is part two of our three-part series where we will walk through the details of getting a 7A loan, especially during the coronavirus outbreak. My name is Georgia, and I'm the Director of Content Marketing here at Fundera. And I'm joined today by Abby and Tyler, who are Fundera's Senior SBA Specialists. Before I pass it off to them, I just have a few logistics to run through. Again, this is part two of the three-part series. If you didn't join us last week, we'll do a quick recap of what we covered, then dive right into the details of the application process here. Join us next week, though, for part three, where we'll walk through what to expect when you're towards the end of this application process and maybe ready to start receiving funds. For today, Abby and Tyler will walk through some informational slides, and then we're going to keep the last 10 or 15 minutes or so open for question and answer. We got so, so many great questions from you guys last week, so please keep it up. Feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A, and we'll try to get through as many as possible at the end of this 30-minute uh, session. All right, without further ado, I'll pass it off to Abby and Tyler. Hey guys, it's great to be with you all again. So a quick recap of what we went over last week. We started with a high level overview of the SBA 7A program. And so these are small business loans that go up to $5 million and they're partially guaranteed by the Small Business Administration. So there are many types of SBA loans and we covered some of those. You may have heard of the 504 loan, uh, SBA Express loan, the 7A loan is one of the most popular, and the ones that we here at Fundera focus on are the 7A small loans, most of which the maximum loan amount is $350,000. These are popular because unlike some of the other ones which have specific needs like going for commercial real estate or business acquisitions, there's a wide range of business purposes that can be used with the 7A program. The, key, the other key thing that we touched on last week was that 7A loans are continuing to fund during the coronavirus, and this is a permanent program. So it's going to continue to be um, active and available even after some of the stimulus funding runs out, and that includes um, stimulus funding such as the PPP and the EIDL loan. So today we're going to get in and Tyler is going to um, revisit some of the qualifications and we'll dive a little deeper into what those qualifications are. Thanks, Abby. Uh, as Abby said, happy to be here. I want to welcome everyone, anyone rejoining us or anyone here for the first time. Uh, some very basic qualifications for the 7A SBA loan are as follows. You need to be at least two years in business. This loan is meant for for mature businesses, not startups. Your personal FICA score has to be over 680. This is a bank requirement. You have to have profitable year to date, this year and last year. So in other years, in other terms, this means that you have to show profit on your profit and loss statement for 2020 and show profit on your tax return last year. You also, also have to have acceptable business and personal debt to income ratios, which we'll touch on later. And then finally, a demonstrated need and use for funding. This SBA loan is meant for businesses to use for working capital and expansion capital. And banks want to see when they lend this money exactly what this money will be used for. Some other considerations that you need to keep in mind for qualifying are that all owners greater than 20% must be guarantors on the 7a loan basically in other terms if you have multiple owners any of them that have 20 percent ownership have to have a personal guarantee on the loan if you own multiple businesses each of them have to be considered for the cash flow analysis this is important because some borrowers will have very successful businesses and there may be some businesses that are startup and not have quite reached profitability this that business that has not quite reached profitability would be put against the business that is profitable, often to the detriment of the borrower, unfortunately. This is just how the banks look at credit analysis though. Some auto disqualifications we have found from our bank partners are that if you have any pending legal action, either for or against you or the business, it will disqualify the file. 
The reason for this is that banks find it risky to lend to a borrower that has possible litigation expenses coming up. Another auto DQ is if your 50% of your business is business revenue is derived from SBA and eligible industries. The SBA gives a very, very long and comprehensive list over what is ineligible. However, some examples we have found common are if you derive 50% more or revenue from religious institutions or from organizations that are partisan in nature, or if you are a nonprofit, this will make you unfortunately ineligible for this loan. Finally, another auto disqualification we see often is if you have ever defaulted on an SBA or government backed loan. Cool. So now that you know, we've kind of retouched on those qualifications, you might be wondering what does the application process actually look like? So that's what we're gonna work through for the second half of this, um, this webinar. So we'll start at a high level. The 7A loan application process starts with a cash flow analysis. And this is where the credit analyst verifies the credit eligibility and tests the business cash flow against our bank partners' requirements. This is where the qualifications that we just went through are, are really dug into, and there's conversations between both you and the credit analyst to better understand your position before any um, either passing you to the next phase or disqualifying you at this point in time is determined. The next step in the process is document collection and packaging. And so this will happen if you meet all those eligibility requirements and pass with one of the bank partners, then you'll move on to this step. And this is where you'll work with a relationship manager to fully package your loan application. And one of the things that we do is we, we focus on that initial cash flow quite often because we don't want to waste your time as a business owner to move on to the document collection, which ends up being a lot more time consuming because they're pretty specific documents. So we want to make sure that you're only doing that extra work if there's a high likelihood that you will fund once you go to the bank. And so that's the final step, which is final bank underwriting and closing. This is when the application is fully completed and then we submit it to the bank and they'll do their due diligence up front and continue working back and forth between both us and you as the borrower. And then once that's been approved, funding happens shortly after. So this next, next thing here that we wanna go through is when you do come to Fundera and work through a SBA loan with us, We've actually broken that down into four steps. So this is a slightly more detailed view of what we just went over. And what this starts at is the initial document collection. And this is where you'll be speaking to an account executive here, funding advisor. And that's where once they've determined that this could be a good fit for your business, then they'll ask for a certain number of documents, a smaller amount of documents that we need in order to determine your eligibility. And these are things like business tax returns, personal tax returns, debt schedule, personal financial statement. Once we have those documents, it goes to the credit analyst for cash flow. And so this is where that eligibility is determined. There'll be follow-up questions just to get a better understanding of your business and make sure that this does make sense for your business. It is the best thing and that any red flags that might have come up are addressed upfront. The third stage here is the packaging, and this is done with a relationship manager. And so a relationship manager will start working with you as a business owner and collect the remaining documents for that application. And this, doc this process is something that we'll get into a little bit more in depth next week, but there's a, a range of documents that we need to collect that are quite specific and extensive. So it ends up being between 20 and 30 documents, depending on the way that your business is set up how many owners you have, if you're planning to refinance, that type of thing. And so um, that's where it's really nice to have a person to work through this together. The final step here is the bank handoff and due diligence. And you will also be paired, it'll be the same relationship manager, but they'll be working with you throughout this entire step after we submit it to the bank. And so, 
what we want to focus on the next few few minutes here before we get into the Q&A is we're really going to dig into this initial cash flow and credit and analysis portion. Next week, we'll touch on the document collection and final underwriting and closing. So I just wanted to level set that for us all here so that Tyler is going to jump into the credit an analysis and what more specifically the bank is looking for. Great. So in order to, to begin our initial cash flow analysis, as we call it, there are a few documents that need to be sent forward uh, to Fundera. These are the bare minimum documentation needed in order to confirm your eligibility for a 7A loan with one of our bank partners. Running through these documents very quickly, we have two different situations. If you have filed your 2019 business and personal taxes, what you would provide is a Fundera eligibility questionnaire, which we would send to you, two years business tax returns, two years personal tax returns, 2020 profit and loss statement, a business debt schedule, and six months of business bank statements. If you filed an extension for your business taxes in 2019, what you would provide is once again, the Fundera eligibility questionnaire, your last two years of business tax returns. So if you have an extension filed for, for 2019, you would provide 2017 and 2018 business tax returns, two years of personal tax returns. Again, if you have not filed 2019 yet, you would provide 2017 and 2018, a 2020 profit and loss statement, a 2019 profit and loss statement, business debt schedule, six months of bank statements, and then just proof of that extension for us. With these documents, we're able to confirm whether or not you would be eligible with one of our SBA bank partners. That being said, once you send us all these documents, what are we doing with it? What are banks looking at? What is this actual eligibility consist of? So in layman's terms, the best way I could break down cash flow analysis into four different categories. The first thing that is analyzed is business cash flow. This is how much cash is the business is generating each year. This is gonna be a calculation of net income plus depreciation, interest expense, and owner salary. All these together, added together, is going to make up your business cash flow. Business debt is the second thing that that's taken into account. This is going to be the amount of cash that the business is paying each month to service business debt. So, for example, if you have a loan that you pay $1,000 a month on, your business debt service would be $1,000 a month. Uh, something to keep in mind is some, not all, but some of this debt can be refinanced in order to help qualify with our bank partners. Those two metrics are put into a debt service coverage ratio. This is your total business cash flow divided by your business debt. A ratio of 1.25 is the standard requirement, but it varies bank by bank. Put another way, this 1.25 means that your business cash flow needs to be 1.25 times the amount of your business debt payments. So using the $1,000 a month example, and it, if you pay $1,000 a month in business debt, in order to qualify, you need to have $1,250 coming into the business each month. Finally, personal debt is taken into consideration as well. Some borrowers have a hard time understanding if their business is strong and their business is meeting all of these metrics, why do they not qualify? And the largest answer is always personal debt. SBA bank partners look at your credit report. They'll look at additional businesses you have. They'll look at basically your entire picture of income and debt to make sure that you, you meet cash flow requirements. If you were to apply with Fundera and if you were unable to qualify, we would be able to pinpoint exactly where you aren't qualifying and how you could best prepare yourself in the future to qualify. Finally, something to keep in mind during the coronavirus outbreak, the 7A loan was here before coronavirus and will still be here after coronavirus. That being said, I know many borrowers have received a PPP loan, an EIDL loan, or both. If you receive either one of these or both of these, you must demonstrate a clear need for additional SBA financing. Going back to the beginning of the presentation, one of the requirements is a demonstrated need and use for the funds. 
this isn't the best loan to have as a backup or to build a large cash uh, reserve. This is a good loan for specific uses like payroll expenses, other operating expenses, growth expansion uh, projects, uh, purchasing inventory, stuff like that. It's not a great loan just to get some cash in the bank. All right, thank you so much, Abby and Tyler. We have a bunch of questions coming in, so let's just dive right in. Uh, the first question I will pass over to Abby is, can the 7A loan be used for credit card debt consolidation? Yeah, so it can be, but there's a few stipulations that come with that. Uh, the credit card must be in the name of the business, and there's an attestation that sign that says all of the uses of the credit card are for business purposes. So that's really specific to making sure that we're not refinancing any personal debt. It's one of the qualifications for this type of loan. Got it, thank you, Abby. Next is for Tyler, what fees are associated with the borrower when they work with Fundera to get a 7A loan? So when you get a 7A loan, no matter where you get it from, there's going to be one fee. And that's going to be the SBA guarantee fee. That fee is going to be dependent on the amount you decide to take. If you take an amount less than $150,000 or less, it'll be 1.75%. If you take a loan amount greater than $150,000, it will be 2.25%. That's a standard SBA fee and will be everywhere. On top of that, Fundera does charge a fee depending on where, what bank partner you match with. This fee is usually about 2% of the loan proceeds and is taken off the top of the loan. So you don't have to pay anything up front. It's just less money from your actual loan. Got it, thank you, Tyler. For Abby, uh, what are the minimum credit scores that are being accepted right now? And has that changed at all do, uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak? Yeah, this is a really good question um, because there are, there's a lot of things that have changed. So we touched on this last week, but the SBA puts out the SOP, which is a standard operating procedure um, set forth by, for this uh, type of loan. In that, the minimum credit requirement is 640. However, banks then take that SOP and can basically add on additional requirements based on their risk appetite at that given time. And so each bank will determine based on their credit box what they feel comfortable with or what they're doing and how they look at the debt service coverage ratios, credit score, a variety of factors. And so um, we, it has been increased recently um, slightly and that's where we see like 650 in some cases. And then in some cases as well, it's more close to the 685 or 680 mark. And if you do have multiple guarantors or owners on the business, it just has to be an average credit score at that threshold. Thanks, Abby. So for Tyler, another question, does your personal debt also include your personal mortgage or is that mortgage counted outside of personal debt? It's a great question. So it is counted. So any mortgage you have, including any additional mortgages you may have is counted in personal debt. Something that is also counted is if you rent your home, that is counted as a quote unquote mortgage and then this counts it counted as personal debt. Also what is counted as personal debt are any tax payment plans you may be on. So personal debt is very a very large umbrella term for payments that you are paying out of pocket personally. Uh, in the cash flow analysis. Great, thanks Tyler. For Abby, what are the, the interest rates on the 7A loan? Yeah, so the interest rate, it is a variable interest rate, which actually plays um, to small businesses owners favor. And that's because this is set by the Federal Reserve. So they base this off the prime rate. And then there's a 2.75% spread added on top. So right now the interest rate is a 6% rate. And that will have the, that 
potentially changes. Um, it can go up, but it can also go down, which is why I say this is plays into your favor. And that is adjusted on a quarterly basis. It's not always changed. We've actually seen it remain at this at that 6% for a little while, um, but that will be reviewed quarterly by the Federal Reserve and then published in the Wall Street Journal. And that is what our banks base the rate off of. Thank you, Abby. For Tyler, uh, a question on factoring in the perspective growth of a company. Does the SBA look into that as they're reviewing their application? So that's a great question. The SBA is not the one that is making these credit decisions. It's banks that are making these credit decisions. The SBA is merely guaranteeing the loan. That being said, the bank partners that we are working with since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, they are considering projections. However, that does not mean that they will use projections and forego profitability this year and the year before. They want to see profitability this year and the year before and then they possibly will want to also look at projections going forward. And so my answer to that would be, yes, they will use projections, but I haven't seen a case where projections are able to qualify a borrower if they are not profitable uh, this year and last year. Got it, Tyler, that's really helpful, thank you. Uh, for Abby, question on, um, can the borrower use a 7A loan to acquire a business and then use the seller's business assets? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked this. Uh, this is an eligible use of proceeds. However, the banks, each bank that offers SBA loans will look at this slightly differently. And how I mentioned that there's this SBA 7A small loan program that goes up to $350,000 that has a specific underwriting model in most cases. And when there is a business acquisition, that acquisition basically means that the underwriting process is going to be much more in depth because they're going to look at both businesses and do additional due diligence on that. So right now it's something that given the current, um, the current economy, we actually, I haven't done one of these deals for a little while, but it can be done and it can be done using the SBA 7A product. It's just finding the right, um, the right bank to be able to do that. Would you have anything to add to that, Tyler? No, I think you put it perfectly. It's an eligible use of proceeds with the SBA, but it is going to be a more in-depth underwriting process and take longer than a 7A loan would if you were just using it for working capital. Great, thank you both. Uh, for Tyler, can you walk through how to calculate a business's cash flow again for the 7A loan specifically? Sure, so it, it is a little bit of a complicated calculation that is I can't get completely into. That being said, the way I would think of it is there's two different parts of the ratios. There's a business part and a personal part. You need to have on each part, so on the business side, at least 1.25 times the amount of cash coming in than you have cash coming out to pay debt. So to use my example again, a qualifying business would have, for example, $1,250 coming in each month and paying $1,000 in debt each month. That's just on the business side. On the personal side, the same ratio is applied. You need to have 1.25 times the amount of cash coming in as you have cash coming out to pay debts. Uh, this is going to include any outside debts you have, any outside business debt, uh, real estate that you may have, et cetera. But it also includes any outside income you have. So it's a little bit of an in-depth. I hope that was helpful. And like I said, if you were to apply through us, we would be able to give you a, a breakdown very specific to your business. Great, thanks Tyler, that is helpful. Speaking uh, to more personal debt questions, this is for Abby. How is a student loan typically calculated in this loan application process? Yeah, I actually, I will defer to Tyler on this one, um, but it is looked at as a personal debt. Um, when taking that into consideration. But Tyler, what would you add on that? Sure, so the only thing I'll add on that is I know a lot of student loans are deferred. 
Uh, we've seen borrowers that are just out of school that are asking for this loan and they don't yet pay their student loan payment. Or we've seen borrowers who they've guaranteed their kids' student loans and their kid is still in college and so they aren't paying the student loan payment yet. The way to think about this, no matter where you are on your student loan payment, is it's going to be treated as a personal debt and we will be taking the minimum amount of payment that you pay on that student loan or that what you will pay on that student loan once you start paying. Uh, so basically, short of it is, it's a personal debt. Got it. Thank you both. Uh, Abby, I'll kick it back to you. Uh, another question is, how long does the process end-to-end -end normally take when getting an SBA loan, 7A loan? I'm, I'm glad you asked this too, because I um, did mean to cover this in the presentation. So on average, we can go from the initial phase of document collection to funding that can be accomplished in 30 days. I will caveat that and say that we have seen it happen in a much faster time frame, around two or three weeks, or it sometimes takes a little bit longer. And a lot of that it's dependent on how engaged you are and, and as a business owner and how, um, how much time you have to devote to this process, since there is some things that we really, we can't move forward with without getting these specific documents, but on average it's 30 days. Great, thank you, Abby. Tyler, uh, a question for you is, how profitable does the business have to be? Is there like a certain threshold that the bank partners are looking for? So that's a good question and it's tough because there is no silver bullet. This is really going to depend on a few things. One, the size of the loan you're going for. The larger the loan amount you want, the more profitable you're, profitable you're going to have to be. Two, it's also gonna depend on how much business that you have. If you're a business with no debt, then you will not have to be as profitable as a business that is highly levered and will need to support all of its existing debt on top of its new SBA loan. And so I, I recognize that it's a little bit of a non-answer, but it really depends. Um, like I said, if you were to apply, we would be able to walk you through exactly where things might be going right to qualify or where things could use improvement to help qualify. Great. Thank, thanks, Tyler. So for Abby, how is a 7A loan different uh, from the original PPP loan that's being offered in the coronavirus outbreak? And would a borrower be able to apply for both of those programs, the 7A loan and the PPP loan? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, want to make sure that this is very clear. So the PPP loan varies from the 7A loan in a few different ways. First, you can apply for both because the PPP loan is, it's that temporary program that has been a part of the CARES Act for businesses that have payroll needs. And so this, there's some specific qualifications that go about like how to get a PPP loan, but basically you must keep your, your employees on staff, but then the SBA will cover 2.5 times your monthly payroll. So this is a temporary program. There's the second round that we're currently in the midst of that still has some financing left in it. But once that runs out, either it'll run out just because it's been fully subscribed or we'll reach the deadline, which is the end of this month. Once that runs out, there hasn't been any new programs or any additional financing set aside for the PPP loan at this time. So that program will end. The 7A loan is different because this is a, this is a permanent program. It existed before any of the coronavirus outbreak and it will continue to exist long after it. And the loan itself, this is a 10 year term loan that you can use for working capital. And it's given to you through a bank and then guaranteed by the government. That's similar to the PPP where the PPP loan was also given through some bank or online lender. It also is going to be a forgivable loan, which is a, a large difference between the 7A loan and the PPP. The 7A loan will have that, that variable interest rate, which is at 6% 10-year term loan. And then one thing I do wanna highlight right now is that the 7A loan, as part of the stimulus package, does have the first six months of payments taken care of by the government. So these are not deferred, this is truly a gift to you, for lack of a better term, so that through this time, you don't have to make those first six months of payments. 
And that is true for any loan that's originated before September 27th of this year. Thanks so much, Abby. Let's try to squeeze one more question in for Tyler. Um, one question is, does the bank partner generally use internally generated reports for all those documents we walked through, or do they require review to compile statements from an outside accountant? So that's a good question. We do have templates for borrowers if they need to fill out a profit and loss statement because either they don't have an accountant or they are unable to get an updated profit and loss statement in a timely manner. We do have bank approved templates you can use. That being said, our bank partners do prefer either an accountant generated profit and loss statement and documents or an accounting software like QuickBooks or Paychecks uh, generated report. Uh, we have seen that bank partners are more willing to accept that and will have less questions about the legitimacy of numbers rather than a profit and loss statement made in an Excel page. Great. Thanks, Tyler. All right. That's all we have time for. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Abby and Tyler, for thoughtfully answering them. A quick reminder to register for next week's 7A webinar, which is on Thursday, and you can do so with the link we'll drop in the chat here, and we'll also follow up that link in your inbox. Additionally, if you're interested in learning more about your eligibility for the 7A loan and how to work with Fundera, check out that second link that we're going to drop in the chat uh, to sign up. Thanks again, everyone, and we will see you next week.